Hi guys, Olive here, here today to tell you what I am planning on reading for Nonfiction November 2020, as well as to give you some nonfiction recommendations in case you need some ideas as you start to craft your own TBR. In case you missed any of Team Nonfiction November's announcement videos that we posted last week, I will link all of those for you down in the description box below, and my video will be up in the cards. But the abbreviated version is that Nonfiction November is a month-long reading initiative. We challenge you to read more nonfiction during the month of November than you ordinarily would. So if you never read any nonfiction, try reading just one nonfiction book during the month of November. If you already read a good amount of nonfiction, try adding a little bit more. The goal is not necessarily to read exclusively nonfiction during the month of November. Of course, you can make that your goal if you choose to. It's just about reading a little bit more nonfiction. It is a very low-key event. The only requirement is that you read at least one nonfiction book during the month of November. If you do that, you are officially a participant. It can be as laid back or as strenuous of a challenge as you would like. We make it so that it can be completely customizable to what you want out of the month and what you're able to do time-wise. We do present you with four one-word prompts in case you're looking for an added challenge or you're looking for some direction in choosing books out of this extremely large genre. This year our four prompt words are time, movement, buzz, and discovery. These words are yours to interpret, bend, combine, or ignore completely. However you want to structure your reading during Nonfiction November is completely allowed and completely encouraged. The only requirement of participation is that you read at least one nonfiction book. Everything else is up to you. I'll be taking the prompts on, Obviously, I wouldn't present them to all of you without thinking that they're actually a lot of fun to take on. So what I'm going to do is go word by word. I will give you a couple of books that I really like, that I think fit the prompts really nicely, at least according to my interpretations. And then I'm going to tell you what books I will be planning on reading for each of the prompts. So for the first prompt, time, some examples of how you could interpret this word could be a book that's been on your TBR for a very long time, a history book about your favorite time period, a book with time in the title, a book about the concept of time. For this first challenge, I would like to recommend The Checklist Manifesto by Atul Gawande. Now, I know this seems like a self-help book, but it's actually much more about the science behind why checklists work with some anecdotes that support those findings. This was written by the author of Being Mortal, which is one of my all-time favorite nonfiction books. Gawande is a surgeon, so he of course talks about the use of checklists in operating theaters, but he also discusses their use by pilots, financial analysts, among others. Some people have trouble seeing the use of a checklist when the line items within it can seem so obvious. It almost seems insulting to your intelligence to need to check off such basic common sense tasks, but in this book Gawande talks about what makes a checklist so helpful? He argues in this book that moving simple tasks from your brain onto a checklist can free up so much brain space. You don't have to be focused on the nitty gritty details because the checklist has got you covered, which allows you to use your brain power for much more complex issues. I think about this book all the time. It gave me a whole new appreciation for checklists, not just as time saving instruments, but also as fuel to become more productive. For the time prompt, I would also highly recommend Why We Sleep by Matthew Walker, a book containing all of the newest science about about sleep. Sleep is something that we spend a lot of our time doing, or at least we should, so it wouldn't hurt to learn more about it. This is another book that might on the surface seem like self-help, but it's actually not. This is not a book that aims to help you sleep better, although after reading this you might have a greater understanding of what's getting in your way. Walker is adamant that sleep is actually more important for your health than diet or exercise, and he explains in this book why he thinks that way. He discusses what's going on in our brains as we sleep. He talks about the health benefits of getting regular 
adequate sleep. He talks about dreams. And he also discusses why, if sleep is so important, we collectively are getting very little of it as a society. I absolutely loved this book. I actually gave it a review here on my channel right after I read it. I will link that video for you in the description box below and up in the cards if you'd like to hear more about it. The first book I'll be reading to satisfy the time challenge is Secondhand Time by Svetlana Alexeyevich. This is both a book that has the challenge word in the title and one that I've been meaning to read for a very long time. This is an oral history of the collapse of the Soviet Union and the emergence of the new Russia. I know a lot about this period from my time spent in college, but getting to hear directly from Russians who experienced all of this themselves is going to be invaluable. Definitely not an uplifting read, but an important one for sure. Also for the time challenge, I have plans to read Stephen Hawking, a memoir of friendship and physics by Leonard Mladno. This was very kindly sent to me by the publisher. The author of this book was a friend and a colleague to Stephen Hawking, the brilliant physicist who we lost not too long ago. Mladno actually co-authored a couple of books with Stephen Hawking, and so I'm sure he got to know him very well. Stephen Hawking is well known for a number of of things, but one of those things is his book, A Brief History of Time. And actually one of the books that Mlad now co-authored with him is called A Briefer History of Time hence the connection to this challenge. I may not be confident that I can wrap my head around physics now or ever, but that certainly doesn't stop me from being interested in learning more about Stephen Hawking as a person. Now, the second challenge movement could, like all four challenges, be interpreted in a variety of ways. You could, of course, pick up a book about a political or social movement, past or present. You could pick up a sports book, a book about exercise or walking. Lots of different options here. I'm going very literal for my first round recommendation, but I'm hoping that it will be timely for some people. That book is This Is Where You Belong, The Art and Science of Loving the Place You Live by Melody Warnick. I didn't know this before picking up this book, but the average American will move house 11 times in their lifetime. That is a lot of picking up and starting all over again, even if you're not moving that far away. I myself have moved quite a few times in my lifetime. I live in Pittsburgh now, but I am not originally from here. And although this is my favorite place in the world now, I did not love it when we first moved here. This book would have really come in handy at that point in my life because it's all about things you can do, steps you can take to feel more connected to the place you live. The suggestions in this book are pretty simple and straightforward. That is to say, easily achievable, but also slightly common sense. But however obvious they may appear, I think because they are such small things, they can very easily get pushed to the side in favor of more pressing life demands. So I think it's good to have the reminder, and it's also really nice to have the associated explanations of why such small things can make such a big difference. It's a charming little book that I really enjoyed. A lot of the things that ended up connecting me to the city of Pittsburgh are indeed things that she mentions in this book. I just did them without realizing that I was doing them. And then there are a few other suggestions that she has that I really wish I would have done. Since we're all spending a lot more of our time locally these days with a global pandemic going on, I figure we can all afford to love where we live a little more. No move necessary. I can't resist recommending this next one for the movement challenge. I know us bookish people don't always tend to be the sportiest, but I absolutely loved The Divine Miss Marble by Robert Weintraub. This is a sports biography about 1930s tennis star Alice Marble, who led an extremely dramatic life both on and off the court. She burst onto the tennis scene only to disappear for two full years after having serious health problems as a relatively young person. Then she made a major comeback and became a media darling, rubbing elbows with Hollywood royalty like Clark Gable. Even after she faded out of the spotlight, she claimed that she married a World War II officer who died during the war, and she claimed that she temporarily served as a spy. I never thought I could be so enthralled by a sports biography, but this one totally sucked me in. I love the way that the author crafts this narrative. He obviously admires Alice Marble, but he puts the work in to verify a lot of her 
really outrageous claims about her life and it is fascinating what he finds out. He's also really funny in this book. He's a big fan of the play on words, which I am all about. Sports fan or not, this book is amazing. Now on to what I will be reading for the movement prompt. The first is another book I was sent by the publisher. That book is called Avoid the Day, a new nonfiction into movements by J. Kirk. This seems like a memoir like no other, certainly not like any other memoir I've ever read. The author of this book travels to Transylvania to investigate a missing manuscript by a Hungarian composer, but then he has some kind of breakdown when he sees too much of his own relationship with his father in one of this Hungarian composer's works. After that, he decides to go on an Arctic cruise with a filmmaker friend of his, and while they are on board the cruise ship, they decide to shoot a horror film, and the author is playing one of the main characters. Again, a memoir like no other, but I am too interested to not give this a try, especially since there's a Helen McDonald blurb on the back. Also for the movement challenge, I am planning on reading Driving Wild Black by Gretchen Soren. This is a book about how automobiles reshaped life for African Americans. Their movement had historically been very controlled, very restricted, so the automobile meant freedom but it also posed a whole host of new challenges. From what I read about this book, it seems like the author doesn't just present the general history, but also that she includes pieces of her own family's history within this book, which I think is so interesting. Obviously, this one has the literal sense of movement, but it's also deeply connected to the civil rights movement, and it has a whole lot of present day relevance as well. The third prompt is buzz, and some ways that you could possibly interpret this could be a book you've been really excited to read, a book that you've seen other people be really excited about, a book that's being talked about, maybe a book that's won an award, or you could go in the direction of my recommendations. The first one is definitely the most obvious one, and that is Buzz, The Nature and Necessity of Bees by Thor Hansen. This is, of course, a book all about bees, how remarkable they are and how important they are. Thor Hansen is one of my very favorite nature writers. All of his books are so entertaining and this one is no exception. So if you want to pick up a book on the natural world during NFN, this is a great choice. But my second recommendation interprets Buzz as a book about music and I am hyped to recommend how Music Got Free by Stephen Witt. This is a book essentially about the digital revolution in music in the early 2000s. It starts off with a discussion of the MP3 file, what it is, how it works, why it was revolutionary, and then he moves into talking about how music started getting ripped from CDs and shared online. He uses a case study of a worker at a CD manufacturing plant in North Carolina who would sneak them out by kind of attaching them to his body and then share them online. It was like this race of who could rip a CD first. It talks about what was going on in popular music, specifically popular hip hop music at the time, and how record executives had no idea how to handle the emergence of piracy. It is a very niche subject, but it is so well researched and in my opinion perfectly executed. It could also be used for the time challenge because it is so much about this moment in time where digital products started challenging the status quo and no one knew what to do about it. I love this book so, so much. I consider it one of my favorites. Everyone I have pushed into reading this book has gone on to really enjoy it, if not love it. So if it sounds interesting to you, your chances are good. I'm also going to be interpreting Buzz to mean music for one of my TBR books. That book is Heavy Metal Africa by Edward Banks. This is a book all about the heavy metal scene in Africa. The author traveled all over the continent talking to fans and musicians and attending shows prior to writing this book. And I know about some of those travels already because, full disclosure, this author is a close personal friend of mine. We've been friends for, I think, almost exactly three years now, and I've been meaning to read his book for that entire time. Ed is one of the coolest people I know, so I know this is going to be great fun. And my second TBR pick for the word buzz is indeed one I've heard a lot of good buzz about. It is Diary of a Young Naturalist by Darren McNulty. The author of this book is just a teenager. He wrote this book when he was 14 going on 15 years old. He was diagnosed with Asperger's at a very young age, and nature became his respite from all the demands of being a teenager and from the bullying that he experienced. 
Christ. Not only does this book sound incredibly touching, and not only is it remarkable that he wrote this when he was so young, but this book was just long listed for the Bailey Gifford Prize, and it just recently won the Wainwright Prize. If you don't know what those prizes are, I did a whole video on nonfiction book prizes that I will link for you down below and up in the cards if you'd like to hear more about them. In any event, this book is getting a lot of attention right now, and I would love to be a part of that conversation. And for our final challenge, discovery, lots of options here as well. This could be a book in a subgenre that you've just recently discovered. It could be a book about a scientific discovery. It could be a book that you heard about on the Discovery Channel. It could be a book about a spaceship like the Discovery, and so on and so forth. For this challenge, I would like to recommend A Short History of Nearly Everything by Bill Bryson. The title of this book is, of course, hyperbolic, but there is a lot of information in here. It's essentially an introduction into many different fields of science, the early discoveries that laid the foundation within those fields and the history of how those came about. I don't always love the microhistory approach, but I do think it's extremely effective here. You essentially get to sample all of these different fields of science, and you get to build a baseline knowledge that you can either just have, or you can choose to build upon it by reading other books and doing further research if any one of them, or more than one of them, catches your interest. This one is really popular for a reason. It's a great book. But I would also like to recommend a lesser known book for the Discovery Challenge. It's one that I actually myself read for a nonfiction November a few years back. It's called The Keys of Egypt, The Race to Crack the Hieroglyph Code by Leslie and Roy Adkins. This is part biography and part history. It is all about this man, Jean-Francois Champollion, who was the first man to decipher Egyptian hieroglyphs. He was a very unlikely candidate. He was a rural Frenchman who loved language, but he became well-versed in Egyptian culture prior to throwing his hat into the ring of ambitious individuals eager to enter history books as the first person to decipher the Egyptian hieroglyphs. It is much more a book about this man, his time period, and his method of going about cracking the code than it is about the hieroglyphs themselves, but it is a very interesting story nonetheless. My first TBR book for the Discovery Prompt is one that I actually just recently showed off in my last book haul. That book is Stalin's Meteorologist by Olivier Rollin. This book came about because of a discovery that the author made. He discovered an album full of letters and drawings that a once celebrated meteorologist in the Soviet Union had sent to his wife and daughter back home when he was imprisoned in the Gulag. After making that discovery, the author decided to research the life of this innocent man who, like so many others, perished while he was in the Gulag. This one will be a difficult read, but I'm sure it will be very interesting. My second TBR book for the word discovery is going to be Beyond the Shadow of the Senators, The Untold Story of the Homestead Grays and the Integration of Baseball by Brad Snyder. The subtitle does a lot of the work here. This is a book all about the integration of baseball in the 1930s and 1940s. 40s, and it specifically looks at a league of Black players who began playing in Washington, D.C., but eventually moved and began playing here in Pittsburgh, in the historic area of Homestead. I selected this book for the Discovery Challenge because it actually represents a personal discovery for me. I had no idea that this team existed. It was actually my good friend Josh who told me that this team was a thing. He's actually been on this channel before, during a nonfiction November, no less. He let me know that the Homestead Grays were a team who played down in Homestead. We have a bridge here in Pittsburgh that I've gone across a million times called the Homestead Grays Bridge, and I had no idea it was named after a baseball team. It was an aha moment for me. I like to learn about all different kinds of things, but I will admit that I do try to focus, especially with history, on local Pittsburgh related things. I think it's really important to know a lot about where you live. So I will be so excited to read about this piece of Pittsburgh history that I didn't even know about. So those are all the books I picked out for my TBR based on our prompts, but there is one more TBR book that I would like to show you. That's the book that we will be group reading together during Nonfiction November. It's The Yellow House by Sarah M. Broom. We'll be reading this book together over the first 18 days of November. We'll be talking about the book as we go along and at the very end, once everyone has a chance to finish. Jill from The Book Bully, who is part of Team Nonfiction November this year, will be the one spearheading this group read, although I will be involved. It is mainly her thing. She made her own announcement video in which she talks about it, so I will link that for you in the description 
description box below and up in the cards. All of us on Team Nonfiction November are going to be talking nonfiction books and recommending nonfiction books leading up to the event and then during November as well. So be sure to follow us on Twitter, on Instagram, on TikTok. All of our links are down below. If you're looking for some new nonfiction creators to follow, of course, be sure to follow everyone on Team Nonfiction November this year. I recommend them very highly. But also, I made a playlist of everyone who has made the nonfiction on booktube tag. It's a tag I created last year. I have a playlist of everyone who's done it. So if you're looking for some people who talk nonfiction here on booktube, I definitely suggest you check out that playlist. And if you're a nonfiction creator here on booktube and you've not yet done that tag, please feel free to do it. Let me know and I will add you to the playlist. So those are all the books and all the matters I had to talk to you about in today's video. If you have any comments or questions about anything you've seen here in this video or about anything in general, especially if there's anything I can clarify about nonfiction November, please feel free to leave me a comment in the comment section below. But if you're looking to connect with me somewhere other than YouTube, I am on a variety of different places on social media and the links to all of my personal profiles will also be in the description box below, below all of the other links. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you're having a wonderful day and I will see you in the next video. Bye.